quite a while ago, someone asked me a question about uh, Jacob wrestling with the Lord. They said, is it right for us to wrestle, quote unquote, with the Lord? And uh, I had an answer that would cause the person that asked it to figure it out themselves. But it prompted me to think about Jacob and uh, to share. And I think this is going to be the first of at least two, maybe more messages regarding this character, Jacob. He is so typical of human nature, of all of us. There's so much Jacob in every single one of us. And you know what? It, it didn't start with him. It started with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It started at, with the fall. You know what the fall in sin really was? The fall really amounted to human beings loving themselves more than they love God. It wasn't that way before the fall in Eden. The fall was really a choice to put self-gratification before the Lord. You know what the essence of sin is? Are you with me? Okay. You know what the essence of sin is? Here's what I boil it down to. This is what I really think it is. The essence of sin is living for yourself out of your own resources, apart from the presence and the power of God. That's sin. And since the fall, living for ourselves is just natural for all of us. Salvation, and I assume that those of you that are seated here this evening I assume that each one of you is saved. I hope I don't wrongly assume that, but I think each one of you would testify to the fact, yes, I'm saved. Well, salvation is really the first step that a person would take to loving themselves more than loving God, or rather loving God more than they love themselves. Salvation is the first step in the right direction. But I think you all would agree with me that there are many believers that are still mainly living for themselves. Are you living to please yourself? Let me pause, have a word of prayer with you, and then I want to share some features of what that looks like, living for yourself, what the self like the characteristics of it are. Let's pray. Father, as we pause this evening, I do pray that you will just use the simple devotional thoughts that we have together tonight to really probe deep in us and reveal to us what otherwise perhaps we wouldn't see, or if we did, we wouldn't admit I just pray that you will use this time that we have together this evening to lay bare any aspects of the self-life in us. I do pray that because I want you to show us how much we need you to transform us from self-love to loving you above all else. We just pray this, that Jesus and our, our God would be glorified in our lives. We pray it in his name. Amen. So what are some of the features of the self-life? Well, you know, I'm speaking to myself here. We're all made of the same stuff. We all have 
either some or all of the aspects of these features that I, I would share with you. I think one area in which the self life is revealed is a hidden prideful attitude because of perhaps some success that you have achieved in your life that uh, may also uh, enhance a feeling of superiority because of some status that you occupy or have occupied or because of some ability that you possess, whether it be intellectual ability or, or some skill set that you have, or perhaps it's a prideful attitude in your appearance. I mean, there's different areas in which, but a hidden prideful attitude of a feeling of superiority. That is a feature of the self-life. Here's a second one. Uh, a desire and a love to be stroked, to be praised, to draw attention to yourself, to be noticed by others, to be thought well of, and perhaps a vehement desire to protect your reputation at all costs. Now, I understand this is, this is just part of, of what all human beings are made of, but that is the self-life. Here's a third thing I wanted to bring up. What does the self-life look like? Well, it's irritable. It's impatient with people. It's touchy and sensitive and often retaliates when it meets disapproval, the self-life. Another aspect I would say is that the self-life manifests uh, itself in us through stubbornness, uh, being headstrong, having an unteachable spirit, being argumentative and harsh and critical and self-righteous and sarcastic. Another way in which you can see the self-life operative in you is being overly self-conscious, where you are fear, fearful of others, what others might think of you. And so you put on pretenses, you hide behind uh, perhaps a Christian mask, and uh, you uh, per portend a false humility, and you seek to impress people, maybe with your spirituality, the self-life. Obviously, the self-life is evident in a jealous and envious uh, attitude and jealous heart when others are successful or uh, receive something that perhaps we ourselves desire to receive and haven't, a jealous, envious heart. The self-life is also, I think, expressed in just a dishonesty and a deceitfulness embellishing your story, exagger exaggerating, and just downright telling a lie. The self-life also is seen in believers when they are stuck in unbelief, when they don't believe God, when they doubt God's promises, when they are discouraged, facing oppression and uh, and pressure. I think the self-life would cause a believer to run from difficulties and would make a believer prone to worry and often to murmur and complain about their circumstances. And one more thing, and I don't think this exhausts it, but I wanted to give you some features of the self-life that exist in us. I think the self-life is greedy. I think the self-life would teach us to love money and to love ease and to be lazy 
and to procrastinate unpleasant and, and uh, difficult things that are ahead. The self-life would have us to indulge ourselves and, and do what we feel like doing and be concerned with what's in it for me. All of those are different features of the self-life. And again, not exhaustive, but gives, gives us a, a good uh, understanding of just how much of that is in us. Well, the story of Jacob. I wanted you to turn uh, to begin with tonight to Genesis chapter 31. Genesis chapter 31. The story of Jacob is an amazing chronicle of how God brings us out of the labyrinth of selfishness. Jacob's a prime example. I think that Jacob represents how you and I live for self, how we express the self life. I believe that before anyone can make any real progress in their Christian life, and before any believer can really effectively serve the Lord, we have to deal with the self-life. God has to deal with that inner man, the selfishness in us. I want you to, having turned to uh, to Genesis 31, look at those words with me as it begins. And he heard the words of Laban's sons saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's. And of that which was our father's hath he gotten all this glory. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban. And behold, it was not toward him as before. Now verse three is where I really want you to see what, uh, what I will share tonight. The Lord said unto Jacob, return unto the land of thy fathers and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. I believe that certainly during those 20 long years that Jacob lived with his uh, uncle Laban, that God had already begun that purging process of Jacob's self-life because Jacob was, he was reaping what he sowed. Laban deceived Jacob, right? As Jacob deceived his father. And Laban cheated Jacob as Jacob had cheated his brother Esau. But in verse 3, God says, all right, enough of this. And God requires him to return and to face it. One of the areas I've mentioned as a feature of the self-life is that in our self-life, we don't want to face difficulties. We don't want to face unpleasant uh, circumstances. And it is the natural tendency of selfish people to run from difficulties. And that's exactly what Jacob did. And 20 years, God let it go. But now he's dealing with him. He's not the only guy that did this. Moses ran away. David, he didn't run away geographically, but in his heart, he ran away from dealing with his sin. Jonah ran away. That uh, parable of the prodigal, he ran away. Remember the 12 or the disciples ran away when the heat and the pressure was turned up. And perhaps we should understand that that is the tendency of human nature. That's the tendency of the self-life, is to run from problems. And God says, I'm going to deal with you, and I'm going to make you face your problems. You're going to have to face it. The tendency of the self-life makes us want to run from difficulties and unpleasant situations to escape the, the painful things in our life or 
the painful past of our life. And perhaps as, as we think about this tonight, we should ask ourselves, am I running from any hidden fears in my life? Is there any unresolved things in the past that is haunting me that I continue to run from? Well, I'm telling you, if you are a serious believer, you're going to come to a point, if you haven't already, where God is going to make you face it. Otherwise, your spiritual life is on hold. You'll plateau and you won't go to higher ground until you're willing to face it, whatever it is. But the tendency is not to face it. But all oh, it is essential that we do. That's why God tells him in that third verse, Jacob, return unto the land of thy fathers, to thy kindred. God has an ironic and, and really a, a wonderful way of making you and I go back and face what we want to forget, what we want to bury, what we want to ignore. God refuses to allow his people to remain unhealed. And as long as we refuse to deal with those unpleasant, difficult things in our life, whether it be present or past, we are wounded people that cannot be healed. And God doesn't like that. He wants to heal us. So it's God's business. He makes it his business. God makes it his business to get you to face your problems in life and shows you how you can be victorious over them because you'll never be a conqueror till you face and overcome those problems in your life by taking the proper measure of God's all-sufficient grace. There is nothing too big for that grace not to be able to handle and cover. So the tendency is we run from difficulties, but the essential in God's mind is you're going to face them one day. You're going to have to deal with them. In fact, that third verse where God comes to Jacob and says return is a command. That's how essential it is. God is commanding him to face what he has run from for 20 years. God is telling Jacob to return to the place where his offended brother lived when he fled in fear from him. It's interesting. Jacob waited until God specifically called him to go. And I believe perhaps his first question would be, well, God, is, is Esau still alive? because he had run for fear. And of course, Esau was alive. And look at what God promises. With this command, face your difficulty, face your problem past, return, I will be with thee. I'll be with thee. That's part of the command that God gives him. God is with us. God is saying, look, you're going to face it, but you'll have my personal presence when you do. I will be personally present with you, Jacob. Only the promise of God's protection was all that Jacob had in obedience to that command. He took measures in his own hands as well. We perhaps know the, the story already. But I want to ask you to consider tonight, is God asking you as an individual believer to return to the place that you fled from? And I'm not necessarily talking about a physical, geographical return. I'm talking about something in your heart. Is God speaking to your heart about getting something right that 
perhaps would be a great difficulty for you to deal with? You're going to have to face it sometime if you're serious about going on with the Lord. You have to face it in order to overcome your fear or your hurt or your pain. And his promise to you is the same promise that he gave Jacob. You can be assured of his presence. I think of how the writer of Hebrews puts it. Let your conversation, literally, that means your way of living, your lifestyle. Let your conversation be without covetousness, without greed. Just be content with such things as you have. You know why? Because he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We have the promised presence of God with us just as surely as Jacob did. Recently, I read the story of a pastor that went to university. He finished his training. He graduated after that from seminary. He took a pastorate and uh, God blessed his ministry and the church began to grow. But as he preached and as he served the Lord in his church, he could not escape the feeling of emptiness in his heart, even though things were going well. And so one Sunday after a great day at church, he went to his study, he locked the door, he laid down on the floor, face down with the lights off, and he told God, if this is all there is, I don't know if it's worth it or not. Isn't there something that you can do for me so that I can have the power to live the Christian life with some kind of effectiveness? with joy, with meaning, he said, at that point, it's as if his life became a briefcase that God grabbed hold of and turned upside down. It was spiritually as if God picked him up and turned him upside down and began to shake him. And he says, as God shook him, he was appalled at what began to fall out of his heart impurity and, and pride and arrogance and unbelief and all the evidence of carnality within began to pour out of this preacher's heart. And he said God shook him until he wondered if there'd be anything left. And then it was as if God stopped shaking him, turned him upside, uh, turned him uh, right side up again. And God poured himself into this preacher and filled him completely. And he said the fiery presence of a holy God permeated every corner of my being. It was as if that dark room was now filled with light and the glory of the Lord. And he said a few weeks later, I had a staff meeting uh, and Someone said that they all noticed that something had happened to their pastor and they wanted to know what it was. So he recounted this experience. He told them what had happened and they said, well, we like the change. You know, only a personal encounter like that with God can bring the kind of needed change to your life and my life that removes that self-centered focus, that self-life, and floods our soul with a God-focused servant's heart. Maybe God needs to pick us up and shake us out, turn us upside down, so that then he can turn us right side up and pour himself, his holy presence, into our lives. I felt like that pastor. I've said to God last year, Israel was in captivity for 70 years. I'm turning 70 years old. 
let this year be one in which I would be set free from the bondage of my self-life.